Today is my pleasure to have with me a wonderful composer, a person, a friend that I admire very much, a composer, conductor, pianist, Oscar Strasnoy, a widely performed composer all over the world, uh, particularly known for his uh, incredible opera music. I believe he's written 12 operas. By, the, by this time, it might be even more, but as far as I know, 12 operas. I hope not. You hope not. <laughs> 12 operas that have been performed uh, in some of the main stages in the world, including Bordeaux, Hamburg, Paris, Buenos Aires. Uh, I could keep naming important opera houses, uh, but it's a pleasure to have you with me. And thank you for making the time to talk about your life, your music, your career and so much more. Welcome. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm OK. Yeah, I guess like everybody in the world, like with um, expectations, just trying to figure out how will be the, if there is a future, how it will be. And yeah, and the future of our profession. Definitely, we'll talk about the pandemic and, and all of this very soon. And just for reference, we are conducting this interview on January 20th, 2021, uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, Joe Biden became the 46th president of the United States. So this is the context in which this interview is being conducted. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a glimmer of hope is coming through our minds, I think. Yeah. Uh, so let me break the ice by asking you specifically, um, we're going to talk about many, many different kinds of music, but let's start by talking about opera and how to begin with, how did you fall in love with opera? What was that inspired you to write so many operas? I, I, I don't know exactly. I think um, I used to go to the to the theater, to the opera house, um, already very small because my parents had an abonnement in the Colón theater where you conducted. And I was always very, very interested in theater, in, in prose theater. I even in a very young an actor um, as like a second thought of being a musician or an actor or both. And thank God I didn't, I didn't choose this second, um, this second um, interest of mine. Uh, but I was always interested in theater. And I think this um, brought me naturally to, to, to music theater. And I think also as a young composer, very young, I was a little bit fed up of these concerts of many, many short pieces. So I had a tendency to to imagine the music as a whole evening thing or a half, or, or, or a half evening um, piece or something. And, and I think this brought me to, to write theatrical pieces. Um, so so I, 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 I tried my hand at the beginning with one opera. Um, which was um, programmed by Luciano Berio, with whom I was like uh, in uh, in contact at that time, and this was the beginning of a of a series of operas, and that's it. That's how I, I, I sometimes, as you know, probably um, you are labeled very very soon as a composer of this and that. And I, I probably when I was, uh, I don't know, 35, I, I wasn't so much, um, probably I wanted to do other things, but I, I was always asked to write um, theatrical music because, because this is what I was doing. And so at some point I did, I, 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 I tried to, to, to write other things and I, I wrote some orchestral pieces and some um, instrumental pieces, but it's true that in comparison with other composers, I have not so much produ production in, in chamber music or solo music or 
this kind of music. Now I'm writing a lot of solo music because of the circumstances. So, um, and I like it. I will, mm. I will go back to this because I have some questions planned for your mm. instrumental music, the concertos that you've written, the extremely uh, okay. outstanding soloists for whom you've written this piece, this collaboration. So uh, we'll, we'll get there in a second, but let me focus for a little bit longer on the world of opera. Um, so following on this, I wanted to ask you, how do you begin the process from the blank page when, when writing an opera? And there is so much, of course, I'm going to be asking you about the collaboration between you and the librettist and so forth. But what are some of the most important qualities that an opera composer needs to have, in your opinion? So I think um, I was teaching a lot. Uh, so I, this is why I, I think I have an idea. But this is a quite late thing. I, I had to put together some some uh, uh, chaotic um, thoughts about the opera. But now I think I have a kind of an an idea. I think um, probably the most important in an opera is the libretto. I really think it now uh, after um, so many projects or even so many failures. Um, um, I think for me, the, 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 um, yeah, the essential thing is to, to, to be convinced by um, literary theatrical um, stuff in, uh, with which you feel um, comfortable and uh, which it gives you um, um, a good perspective of uh, fulfillment of uh, um, drama on a stage. So the, I think this has very much in common the opera and the cinema. Um, I always recommend my, my students uh, my, or colleagues who want to write an opera to read a wonderful book of conversations between Hitchcock and Truffaut wow. about the making of, of films because there you see how important the choice of, um, of a functioning um, uh, text is. So this is, I, I would say, this is the, the, the most important thing to, to choose a text not for its literary qualities in itself, but also for what your your what is your intuition with what it will be its um, blooming on a stage accompanied or or um, um, complemented with music. This is this is very important. So when you have this first. Uh, text, you are convinced of, you have to find a, librati a librettist if you don't have one and try to make out of this something which can work with music. And when you have this, is if you have uh, like a training and if you have like um, uh, experience, I think it's quite easy after that. It's a, if it's difficult, is I think because the libretto is not good. Um, when it starts to be laborious and and slow and annoying, if you don't have uh, pleasure in doing this, it's because it's, there is something um, not working. Another fantastic book I recommend always to to young people is the correspondence between uh, um, uh, Richard Strauss and Hofmannsthal. Because there you have the, um, um, on one hand, the, um, uh, the theatrical musical thought of Strauss, which was amazing, which was fantastic, is somebody who really mastered the realization of words into theater is a genius of, um, of music theater. And all the questions extremely technical, he's asking 
um, Hoffman's Dahl, who was a fantastic theater, theater person, a, a dramaturg, like you say in German. Um, and so this um, contrapoint between a, a musician with great theatrical gifts and um, dr a drama writer, a, a play writer with um, musical ambitions. This combination, combination is a fantastic team and it's the ideal team you can dream of when you try to write opera. Fascinating, and especially when they were such uh, great collaborators, the two of them. Yeah, I think it's the, this, and probably Boito and Verdi, and of course, Mozart and Da Ponte, these are the, the greatest um, uh, tandems. Uh, Dream teams. <laughs> Dream teams, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me ask you, I'm going to go back to the collaboration with librettists and stage directors in a second, but I, it occurred to me, um, I was fortunate, uh, this is just for those listening, uh, to conduct the world premiere of one of your operas, The Requiem, based on Faulkner's uh, Requiem for a Nun. Matthew Jocelyn was the librettist for this opera that uh, we premiered at the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires. Uh, that is how Oscar and I met and we've become very good friends since then. Um, I know that for this opera, which was based in the South, you did a trip. It was like a research trip that you and Matthew did to the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, yeah. You exposed yourself to the type of music that would have been played in those regions in kind of the deep South. Uh, the opera itself, you have an incredible ear. Uh, you have an incredible and very sensitive imagination. The whole opera begins with a solo harmonica, and you've incorporated many unusual instruments into the orchestra. So I wonder if this is a process that you do for every uh, stage work that you write, whether you can have the luxury of doing a trip or some kind of local regional research on it and how this process works for you. Uh, and also a related question, do you, I mean, you're a fantastic pianist. I've heard you play in, in some of our rehearsals. Do you work a lot from the piano? Do you sing the the lines of the opera as you're writing it? What is your your everyday process as you're working on an opera? Um, well, the first question is if I make um, for every opera, if I, I I do research and if I um, yeah I, I try in any case uh, I try to do what you call in theater the dramaturgical research. So to, re to if it's based on historical things like it was the case of Requiem, um, I try, of course, to read as much as possible. In the case of Faulkner, of course, you have many things which are perfectly foreign for me, like the music uh, of the south of the United States or this, the, 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 the language, the language uh, used by Faulkner, the language uh, spoken in these regions. And of course, I had to do a, a, a big research about this. I am, uh, since always, uh, a big fan of uh, Faulkner, of Faulkner's. And, um, but yeah, you there you have um, you have to do this uh, if you want to do a kind of serious thing. And I still am not. I think if this opera is played again, I would do a big revision of this opera. I'm not completely convinced of the musical result of this opera. But still, it was a very interesting. Um, uh, uh, project and uh, as you mentioned we traveled with Matthew to Mississippi, um, Arkansas, all these states. Um, Matthew is North American so for me it was a fantastic uh, company to have because he speaks of course perfectly the, even if he, he, he has a different accent he, he, he speaks the language very well and and he's very, very easy going with people. And so it was a fantastic trip. We heard incredible music. Uh, um, 
unbelievable musicians, sometimes kids, sometimes like 15 years old. Wow. Um, we went to, um, to, uh, 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 to a church service a Sunday to listen and to participate of, um, of um, yeah, of a God, a God service and so, and it was a fantastic thing. And, and then we, we made this project. And yes, I would say for every project, I try to do as much as I can in this direction. Um, and I try that. Uh, I try that every project has its own logic, and not to repeat, in a way, a, a method or something. Um, sometimes with more or less success, but um, success in the in the sense of uh, being um, um, happy with it, with the thing, but. But I think the, the process of, of imagining this thing is quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Wonderful. And then the, the very long question, the, the, sorry, the, the second part was about your compositional process, whether you, you work a lot on the piano, on the desk, uh, just with the score and the sketches, or, and or whether you also sing the, the parts, the lines. Yeah, I always sing the parts. This is very important. So, because if you don't sing the parts, nobody can sing the parts. I mean, if, if you as a composer um, are, are unable to sing, uh, it's be, you, you know, as a friend of mine say, in music, the things are easy or impossible. <laughs> you have nothing in between. And so if it's impossible for you, it's impossible for everybody. So. Yes, and I play very much. Uh, I, I, I use a piano. Um, I write on the piano. I write per hand. And I, but first, I, I, I write, I, I work very much on the, on the words itself. I try to memorize the words in order to, to have, um, to have it incorporated in my mind, at least each scene or something, and even what I do before. And this, I, I, I try to do it with every, what I do is to record the librettist um, um, speaking the whole libretto. Oh, wow. Because it's very important to have the, the, the mental rhythm in which they thought the thing, which is not exactly yours. So when I work with living persons, like it's the case of Matthew, or in here in Germany, I work uh, words two, yeah, I think twice with uh, Christoph Hein, which who is a fantastic writer. And it's such a nice thing to have the writer's voice, you know. Wow. Yeah. So. I think this is these are the basic things. Yeah. Following up on this, so the collaboration with text, working with librettists, working with then once you finish the piece, working with a stage director. Which in in the case of the the opera we did together, the librettist was also the stage director, Matthew. But I imagine most of the times this is not the case. So, what is essential in this type of work, in this type of collaboration with the various uh, moving mechanisms that are part of the opera and then you show up to rehearsals as the composer uh, some would say the one with the the ultimate truth about the piece but how do you negotiate all this power dynamic with well, the British um, the stage director yeah, the yeah. Um, they, I, I would say uh, the ultimate truth musically I try I try not to not to interfere too much in the work of the stage people who are more than one person of course you have the the, the director but you have also the the very important person who is the uh, set designer etc um i mean when i work with matthew i worked um probably three times with matthew uh, we understand each other so well and we talk so much beforehand while doing the piece that I, I nearly don't have to interfere nearly at all in his work. I try to, to be concentrated 
only in the music, because also I think, and this is also something I always say, is a, an opera, a, an opera has to work um, as an acoustic art, like like a like a sonata, and and it has to work on a radio. So you it, the, the, you have to as a listener, if you know the text, if you understand the words, the opera has to make sense without a staging. So it has to function as a theatrical object without the necessity of having a stage in front of you with uh, customs and with acting, etc. And if you look at the greatest operas, such as Figaro, such as any Wagner opera, any, any um, Verdi opera, any, above all, Strauss opera, Bartok, uh, and not so many more, like Berg probably, um, you can listen to these operas and you have the whole stage in your, in your head and it works. So this is the ideal of, a, of I think, in my case, uh, I, I believe this, um, of, um, of a composer of opera so that it works without the stage. So if everything is, is sold already in the drama dramaturgy of the writing, you know, uh, of the of the musical thing, so you can give it to anybody and it will more or less work. I It happened to me um, twice or three times that operas of mine are done without my presence. From the first rehearsal to the to the to the opening, and I mean, I think it works, or it works more or less as I would like to. So I think this is the the the, the key point. If if you remember when we worked on Requiem, I was mostly only concentrated in the music. Uh, and the, mu the music and the relation of uh, the balance singers, the speed, the 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 connections, every everything. The most important things are the transitions and etc. And but what they did it on stage or etc. wasn't my my biggest concern. I was actually very surprised that you were so um, hands off with many things. Uh, it, it really gave me the sense that you had a lot of experience. You, you know, sometimes you see composers who, who want to be control freaks, so to speak, and they want to have a say with everything. And, and you were really trusted your team. You really trusted Matthew. First of all, I could tell what a great relationship the two of you had established. And, mm. and of course, the, all, the, all the, you know, very uh, important parts, like you said, of the artistic crew, the designers, um, the the lightning people you you really had a lot of respect and trust for everybody and for me as the conductor and this is the other thing I wanted to ask you if it's been the case in in others of your operas or if you've had different kinds of situations you were also very much um, sometimes uh, consulting with people about w w whether to do this cut here or there or to move this uh, transition to this other place or to shorten it so you had a very flexible mind, which I found, uh, out, you know, outstanding. It was really uh, surprising to me. So, but have you had different kind of situations when you decide to make a cut, uh, kind of towards the, the, you know, towards the premiere or something, and you have resistance from either the stage director or the conductor working with you? Have you had situations like this where the the team is not such uh, so oiled up as it was in our case? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, actually, of course, the most difficult thing is for the singers because they learn the whole thing, and then you do a change, a minimal change, and they, they everything so is so much incorporated in their body Muscle because <laughs> they learn it by acting. So that if you move something, uh, they lose their references right. uh, because they know they enter when the other is singing this. And so this is the most, probably the most, um, the, the, the most difficult thing to deal with. But other, otherwise I don't think so. I remember even once 
was quite incredible. And it's exactly as you say, I, 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 the real finishing of a score is on stage because there are so many parameters that you can't calculate on a table and that happen only on stage. And that's how the thing finishes to, to come into light. And I remember once in Hamburg, we had the, we had a, the, the general rehearsal of Le Bal, one of my operas. And, and I decided to be a big, uh, to do a big change in the last scene. Wow. Uh, between the general rehearsal and the premiere. So the premiere was never, it was never rehearsed, never played, this change. And Simon Young was the, the conductor who is, a, who is a very, very incredibly professional person. She was a little bit concerned of this change. And also in Germany, you have this completely irrational system of having two orchestras, you know, they are like um, rotations, rotation, which is incredible with a new piece. So the, 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 some people in the orchestra, they had never played the things like that. They, they, they took the notes from the other crew and they discovered that there was a change. Which somehow so, but, functions okay when you're doing La Traviata and they've played it 58 times, but when you're doing a world premiere, wow, terrifying. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But still, I somehow, you know, it's, an, it's a living art. So if you don't have this, what's for to do that? Um, uh, yeah. I, I think this is, a, this is the important thing. And of course, the second set of changes come after the, the premiere. And when you have, or even when you have a little bit time, like two, three years to think about it. And then you do the change, the, the, the definitive um, um, version, you know? I was working this year uh, on a complete crazy project. Uh, probably I told you, they asked me because of this uh, virus uh, conditions to reduce Saint-François d'Assise mm -hmm. by Messiaen um, to make up like um, orchestra, uh, um, to the reduce the orchestra. Pandemic it's a huge version. orchestra. <laughs> it's, it's a smaller <laughs> yeah. size it's pandemic version of orchestra. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and um, which is the first time, and I hope the last time I do this work. But it was fantastic to to study this this incredible score. Uh, you know, thousand five hundred pages of fifty six lines. Mm. You know, it's quite it's a complete crazy thing. I did it with a team of we were six working on this, but still, for me, it was fantastic to. You see that Messiaen made big changes between the first version and the second um, stage of the of the piece, and secondly that we made changes because the piece is too long, and we we allowed ourselves to cut a little bit of the opera so that that it makes some sense on a stage, you know, and of course it's a little bit of a sacrilege, but. <laughs> But somehow it it's very you learn very much because it's not your stuff, it's not your material, so you can treat it like anything. And and I think I learned a lot doing this. Wow, wow. Yeah. So uh, I was gonna I'm gonna come back to the pandemic and the situation and and the work you've been doing in a moment, but let me segue onto orchestral instrumental music. We've talked a lot about opera and all, you know a lot of the work you've done but you've also written very important instrumental music collaborated with some of the most distinguished soloists of our time you've written a violin concerto for isabel faust you've written a piano concerto for alexander tarot uh, what do you look for when you write instrumental music is it different to you from writing an opera um yes and no um it is, it is different because uh, singers is like another species, you know, but um, um, but on another hand, 
I think um, you have to look. I mean, I I, I like um, I like the music when um, when it it has some conflict uh, in itself, and and of course you can't write opera if you don't like conflicts, uh, and and with the instrumental music in a way it's the same. Um, you need memorable things. You need conflict. You need um, a kind of contagious um, contamination of a material, etc. Or I need this, and these are more or less the same things. There is a big difference. Um, is that in the opera, of course, the form is given by by the libretto. And this you don't have in instrumental music. So you have to invent a kind of a subliminal libretto, which is called the form, which you can do it while doing it, but in a way it is different, of course. Um, do you tend to plan they are complementary both? Do you, do you tend to plan head a lot, the, the structure, the form, the content of the subliminal message, or do you I mean, you must work, maybe every project is different, but do you tend to work more spontaneously, you know, like they call it through composing or do you plan a lot ahead of time? Um, I like very much uh, uh, something Ligeti said. I heard him saying um, uh, uh, directly, he said, um, I, I always start, he used the word um, naively. But I think he, he didn't mind this. Um, he wanted to say he starts in a complete intuitive way, like playing on the piano. And then he has an, a, a complete gestural um, idea. And then out of this intuitive idea, which he called naive idea, he planned an organization of this intuitive um, material. So from the logic is given by this material, which is a kind of, to uh, first of all, is a kind of um, automatic writing. So I like, actually, I like very much this Ligetian uh, method, if you can call it a method. So to start with um, with um, with an automatic gesture, and then to find the logic inherent to this material. This I like very much, and this I try to to use as much as possible. But of course, having written some things, you always have your your little tools, your little workshop and you apply things which you apply to other things because you know it works etc so I, I don't like to 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 I don't like to how do you say to to plan first of all a kind of form without having them without knowing what the material will be um, but I very often, or probably since twenty years, I I like to 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 work with. Um, it's not a method, but it's a kind of um, it's kind of a, a a habit. Is to work with. Um, you can call it a contagious manner or contagious um, form, which is you have a kind of a very simple material. And this material becomes uh, gets kind of an attack or an outer attack of foreign material, which makes it kind of of um, uh, ill or, or sick. And then it tries to defend itself of this foreign um, thing with its own uh, antibodies, and and out of this it comes out something which is not the first, not the second ideas, but a kind of a third idea. I think the model of this would be probably the Diabelli 
variations, <laughs> which is a, for me is a monumental work of exactly this, a very naive uh, material which gets attacked and attacked and attacked and attacked until you barely recognize the original and then you come back to the original. Mm. Fascinating and very timely mm -hmm. for the COVID-19 uh, <laughs> infection. <laughs> so now a very general but very simple question. Uh, in your opinion, what is the role of music nowadays? Hmm. I, I was asking myself very much this question and I, music and art in general. Um, and it's very difficult to give um, a general um, answer. Um, because music, as you know, is very much related to your own identity. It's nearly like clothes or like um, language. You are identify, identified to, to the kind of music since you're a child or probably most since you are mostly since you are an adolescent. So, and it depends the kind of training you have. So, but I think for 90, probably 98% of the people, the music is a prop, like, like, I don't know, like, um, like a picture you put on your wall or something. Um, like a scarf or a hat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, a hat and a scarf is, are very, very important things because it's been a cold Berlin. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would say it's very difficult to answer this question nowadays because you can't speak of music in a general way. You have entertaining music, you have party music, you have elevator music, you have supermarket music, you have opera music, which is not necessarily art music because most of the people go to the opera just to, as they go to the restaurant or they go to 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 the brothel. So I, I, oh, probably less than what they do with the brothel. So actually it's very difficult to answer. Yeah. Um, the, the the difficult times nowadays are with the art in general. I said, which is what is the, the the function of art in our days? If art is not just entertainment, uh, is it like it used to be in the 20th century, like an artifact of thinking or, or of enhancing your thinking, or is it just um, ornament? Um, I think and. And nowadays, in these uh, times, of course, it comes directly this this question because the the thing which was eliminated from the beginning. I mean, the the very first thing and the one I it seems n not to come to the normal brains of um, politicians is what we do with the art today. Um, I mean, everything is flattened on, on the internet. So you see theater, opera, porn, everything on the on two dimensions. And, but this is not music. This is like a postcard of music. And this is even less um, uh, opera. It's just like a, a little, um, how do you say? Like, like a little- Like a souvenir uh, of a pastime. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So, so do you worry that uh, this is be especially because of the pandemic or is it just a, some kind of illness of the times that art is losing its value and its currency in, in today's society? Yeah, well, it's, I, I mean, it's nothing new, uh, something it comes from very, very old times. I think um, um, th there is a, I mean, the things are, the things are evolving. Um, we don't know in which direction, and I hope, my only hope is that when this thing will be over, that my hope is that we won't come back to what we were in 19, uh, 2019. I hope it will come out something completely new, uh, which is not uh, traviata in every theater, which is not 
the system of uh, contemporary music festivals, which work more or less like any festival of any kind, etc. That it will be like a reflection out of this. Um, um, but um, so I don't know. Ideal, in an ideal world, how should an opera house be run? How should music festivals uh, function? Uh, what would you like to see change? Um, I think there is not an ideal world for that. Uh, you you have only like like um, special cases every time. I mean, the, if you look at the arts uh, and if you look at music, you only in the history of music you only have exceptions. You have no habits. Every great composer was an exception. Uh, every great composer didn't do what everybody was doing. So this system of festivals is ill in, its, in itself because it repeats a norm. It, it, the programmers, they, they pick up names because uh, they sound more or less the same. People are doing the same techniques and things. And, and actually you impose a norm with this kind of thinking. Instead, in, 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 instead of trying to find the exceptions of this, which is the, what is doing the, the law in music, um, so it's very difficult. I don't know. Sometimes I think the opera is like the no theater, you know, the, the Japanese traditional mu uh, theater is that like it's a closed history and there is no opera anymore. We are just the, like the, um, the echoes of, of the golden time of the opera, but this grand opera with singers, uh, orchestra on a pit, etc., is probably something completely uh, not uh, belonging to our time anymore. We have to find a new form, uh, taking this as like an example, but, but, um, but we can't repeat a formula like, um, like Strauss operas or thing. I think this is over. I have the feeling. Yeah, it's quite uh, refreshing to hear this coming from what you know, what I consider to be one of the most successful opera composers of our time. Uh, and also, you've not been an outsider. You've uh, you've been. Uh, I'm going to ask you in a moment about your your background and the places you've studied and you've lived in. Um, and you've been an important voice in the new music world. You've been artistic director of a very big festival in France, Presence. Um, so uh, it's it's refreshing to hear this coming from you. Uh, I think it, obviously it shows the kind of uh, self, how self-critical you are with your own music and, and with the whole new music community or, or music community as a whole. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you learn of your own mistakes. Uh, this is how it has to be. And you, you, I, I think I, I imagine myself, my, my, I, I mean, my, my, my favorite composers are the composers who are always uh, challenging the, the, the composers they were. Like Ligeti was five composers. Uh, Schoenberg was, I don't know, each, each, each work of Schoenberg's is a, like a new composer. And you have uh, Stravinsky, it's amazing how he went from one thing to the other and he was always, putting his own work into question marks. And, and this should be also a political thing. I mean, um, if you, um, so if you, um, I mean, the worst which could happen is what happens to mostly all opera houses is that they program always the same and they, they, they pick up names, the star system think, and it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it stays in a complete frozen state in a status quo, uh, which is death deadly for the, for the art and for everything. You have to challenge yourself, so they but it's not easy. It's not easy because the structures are, are, are always um, there to resist um, changes. Even the most, the most uh, theoretically um, open things 
are always there to resist change. Somehow it perpetuates this uh, power in the same circles and the continuation of the famous names and those who studied with them. And uh, you would like to yeah, see but, more. You yeah, would like to see more inclusion or more diversity in who is being programmed and given. In any case, but also you know sometimes it's not even a, like a question of power. Sometimes it's just imagine how many people learn violin or oboe or any of the orchestras, uh, orchestra instruments. And of course they want to play in an orchestra. They need to, to play in an orchestra to, in order to, to, to make a living. And, and this, just this structure of music schools, of uh, learning Mozart and Beethoven all your life, many, 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 many people, this makes like an like an extra mental resistance of the thing, you know, it's like a meta resistance because the people need to work in what they like to play, etc. And this makes things uh, very um, frozen. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my my new um, tool is to have my own people. I try to. I have a an ensemble now in Switzerland, and we try to do ourselves the thing. I play myself the piano and other keyboards, and we try to to do something out of this. And we'll see. But of course, not every composer can have his own tool. It's, it's a kind of luxury thing. But um, I don't know. Uh, I have no answers. <laughs> this is this is this is good. We're we're here. It's a, it's a, an open dialogue. So, <laughs> the next thing I want to ask you is uh, about your background. And you speak. You're fluent in many languages. I think you speak pretty much like a native French as well as Spanish, Italian, German. Uh, I know you've lived. In, in addition to you know you 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 come from a Russian Jewish background. You were born and raised in Buenos Aires. But you left Argentina when you were very young. I believe you went straight to France. Then you lived some time in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. And you've been in Germany, in Berlin, for at least 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how, has, how has this all uh, informed who you are and, and the type of um, education you've received, the mentors you've had? Uh, share, us, uh, share with us a little bit about your education and your background, if possible. Yeah, um, yeah. In a way, it's true what you say. I, I change country and languages, and so. But you, you are always with yourself for good and for bad. Uh, you are always um, very important at this uh, first years of education, and then you try to find people. So, um, true. I was in Japan one year. That was quite interesting because you are in a very different um, uh, society and and the arts are very different, etc. But um, actually, the most important are the two, three um, professors you have. Not so much the. I, I mean, at least for me, uh, the I, for me very important was Hans Tenner. As a, as a professor, probably the most important of all. I was close to Gérard Grisé as well, um, and to Berio in, in the last years of his life. This, these were very important um, encounters with people. Like, um, yeah, they changed my way of, um, of thinking, the music. And but the rest, I don't know if it's. I mean, it's it's very important to know other countries because it opens a little bit your provincial um, way of thinking. So you understand uh, that nowhere is the center of the world. In uh, I, there is a fantastic, very nice sen uh, little um, uh, phrase of uh, Juan Jose Saer with an Argentinian writer who said, if you are born in Posadas, you, as an intellectual, you want to, to be part of the intellectual life of Santa Fe. But when you are in Santa Fe, you want to be part of the intellectual life of, of Rosario. 
if you're in Rosario, you want to be part of the Buenos Aires, like the biggest um, uh, intelligentsia. And then you come to Buenos Aires and it's so mediocre like all the rest and you want to go to Paris. <laughs> It was exactly what he did. He went to Paris. And then you are in Paris and it's the same provincial shit like everywhere. And then you have nowhere to go. And there you understand that everywhere is completely mediocre and provincial. <laughs> but at least you you have this experience. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> that, that's a very beautiful referential point. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's go back to the idea about this dreadful pandemic that we've been in, uh, in for pretty much almost a year now. Um, you mentioned a couple of important projects that you uh, have been keeping you active. You mentioned your ensemble in Switzerland. You mentioned your uh, uh, scaling down of the Messian opera. Yeah. Um, any, anything else you'd like to mention that you've been doing or finding inspiration in during this pandemic? Yeah, yeah, very important. I, I understood the 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 importance of friendship wow. in music. Uh, friendship in general is very important, but in music it's, it's very important as well. So, and I thought, okay, probably theaters and orchestras won't ever open again. I don't hope so, but, but let's say this. And so I wrote only solo music for friends. Wow. So I wrote for, for Alexandre Tarot. I wrote like a cycle of for solo pieces. Then I wrote, uh, also a series of, of pieces for Isabel Faust, um, solo violin, and now, now I'm writing a series of pieces for solo guitar for Pablo Marquez, uh, who is a fantastic, one of the greatest guitar players. So they, they are all friends of mine. They feel pity uh, of poor composers who have no work, <laughs> so they are open to play. Um, the music of uh, composer friend, and I think this is, I mean, it's something uh, we have to value very much now to have very good, good friends and good musicians who are open to play, um, to play music. Wonderful. So this is what I was doing. Yeah. And I, I've taken a lot of your time, but I have a um, final question to, to round up the, this uh, conversation we've had. And it's got to do with your advice for young musicians. Uh, anything that you think might be helpful for somebody considering a career as a composer, as an artist, as a musician, anything that has been valuable to you or any advice that somebody gave you 20, 30 years ago that you think you could pass on? Hmm. Um, um, I, I can pick some ideas. So one important was given to me by a professor of mine, and it wasn't given as an advice, but um, as a critic, actually, of one of my very, very early pieces. He said, never write exercises because nobody is interested in exercises. Every work is a work of art. So um, this was an advice, but I think if, we, if you think like kind of in a bigger way is I would say never write if you are bored of what you or, or never get bored of your, of your, of your work. If you, if you get bored, bored of your own work, it, it's, I mean, everybody will get bored of your work. This is a kind of a very easy um, test. You know, if you're writing a piece and you look at it and you say, what's a boring piece of music? Um, the most probable is that everybody would think that. And it, counts, it can sound a little bit naive or a little bit simple, but actually it works always. If you look at the history of music, no boring music survived the, the filter of time. So if uh, let's say 500 years of music have proven this, I mean, why it shouldn't be applied to our time? It's very, very, very simple, but I think, I mean, it can sound like commercial or, or, or entertaining, but it's not meant to be like this. It's really like, um, it's a very deep, important thing. 
this um, this boredom in art is um, it's a very negative thing. Thank you so much, Oscar, and uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I look forward to seeing your person again and reprogramming <laughs> your piano concerto, which we were going to be playing here in Davis uh, this season. But of course, uh, we will be rescheduling it for whenever, uh, as soon as we can. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.